Thank you very much and uh, good morning everybody. And it's a pleasure to stand here and present the research work we've done uh, through many years. And uh, thanks to Mr. Urban Future and Professor David Simon and Professor Stephen Agong at CLIP and the CLIP board. Um, I will start to make a small introduction about the history. Everything has a history and even this research. So we started to cooperate between the two cities and universities in 2005 in Homa Bay uh, and also here in Kisumu. Uh, now we are focusing on Kisumu with Enviros. Uh, we have a reality studio, a master course at Chalmers in close cooperation with Just and Maseno since many years, since 2005. So it has its history. Uh, and along this journey, where we are blending students from four universities with teachers and different disciplines, uh, introducing the transdisciplinarity research. Uh, and it's an exploring studio. Uh, and uh, we went here we came here for two months, 2017, and we will come back in 2018, so we are preparing now. And we are also having small booklets that we will hand over from uh, Realty Studio students to the clip. Now, We have also a Facebook site that is very vivant and a home page is ongoing. So you are, can visit that one and you see what's going on in uh, the, the informal settlements here now. Well, the cooperation with CLIP GOLIP and uh, the session for today, we will present what we did and starting point was in 2012. Uh, on marketplaces and ecotourism. And it was a big thing. And it was newly built, Mr. Urban Futures, and the, all the activities. So along the line with developing Reality Studio, also Mr. Urban Futures came up. And in charge was my colleague, Professor Bjorn Malbert at Chalmers. So we had a lot of students at the first day, 26 PhDs to handle this in two topics, ecotourism and marketplaces. And uh, we had communication challenges, disciplines, distances, stakeholders, all these things. So we decided to create a core group of seven students and uh, you will meet some of them today during this coming session. Uh, so a core group was a try and to handle all these topics and subtopics and PhDs. So I will start to welcome Eva Maria Jan Sand. She is a postdoc now holding her PhD in economics, the business school. And Helena Kraff, she is uh, doing her PhD now in design, and I am her supervisor. Um, and um, I could say that we are now going to revisit Dunga Beach as the first lesson of learning from your PhD. Good morning, everyone. I'm Eva Maria, and this is Helena. And as Maria said, we come from University of Gothenburg, and I'm from business school, and Helena is from design school. And uh, we are here today to talk about our collaboration between the two of us, and between the other PhD students in this core group and also with the practitioners in Dunga. And this is uh, from Dunga Beach, this uh, 
photo. It's, it's a beautiful morning, and uh, the fisherman is coming in with the quote of the day, and uh, you should go there in the mornings. It's really, really beautiful. You saw the evening yesterday, but the mornings are tremendously beautiful. <laughs> So um, the project is a transdisciplinary project and it is about participatory ecotourism development in Dunga. And uh, it was initiated in 2012, as Maria said. And uh, it, for us, transdisciplinary research is uh, both about uh, practical and academic results. And we have taken this also further into action-oriented research to also see practical results of the research. There. Um, so the collaboration has been between countries and between faculties and uh, disciplines, uh, between the University of Gothenburg and uh, Yost University and Masayana Yost University in Kenya. And um, here you can see that it's not only about us coming to Kisumu and Dunga, but also that the two of the guides also got the opportunity to go to Gothenburg last year to present at a conference on inclusive tourism. Uh, and uh, they also shared knowledge with other guides and other stakeholders in Gothenburg. And also the other PhD students got the opportunity to come to Gothenburg. We, we had a course together, for instance. And uh, this collaboration between PhD students was about marketplaces and ecotourism, as Maria also said. And uh, the marketplace uh, group was uh, Helena Hansson, Franklin Wango, who are not here today, and Jennifer Cheno. She was, yeah, you're here, waving. <laughs> Uh, and the ecotourism group was me and Helena and Franklin Ochende, who will present after us, and Joshua Wanga, who's over there waving as well. <laughs> um, so what we did together uh, was to discuss things, of course, uh, and we arranged some joint workshops in Dunga, and we also had some joint field trips, for instance. But we had a good collaboration in the sense that we could discuss things that we all knew something about. So um, we chose Dunga because they already had um, an ongoing ecotourism activity. And they were also very interested in uh, collaborating and involving the residents in the development of the tourism. So uh, it was about joint knowledge creation. And uh, although our, our theses are very different, the four of us, we had the common theme, theme of ecotourism and participation, which made us come together, come together somehow. Yes, so the participatory process with the guides in Dunga, it has been open-ended and iterative. And where we have gone from creative workshop and idea generation into small-scale implementation which apart from signage and waste collection, includes things such as the development of a graphic profile, uniforms for the guides, a cultural day, and also development of uh, full day guided tours, which involved residents of the community. And a few years into the project, we initiated the integration of women in tourism and explore the possibility of them also working as guides. And a group of women, many of which you met yesterday and who are also here today, they have formed uh, their own CBO, Dunga, Dunga Women in Tour Guiding. And there have, within the project, been trainings for women held by us as researchers, but also by the male guides in Dunga. And also, the guides in Dunga, they saw a need to strengthen other local guide groups around Kisumu County. Um, so they wanted to initiate uh, an association that is countywide. And me and Eva Maria have been in the uh, setting up 
phases of that, um, where we have organized in collabor with, collaboration with the guides, uh, for example, an exchange trip to Kakamega Rainforest, where they have experienced uh, both uh, male and female guides, uh, which where they could uh, learn from and share experiences. So there has been a lot of positive transformations within the project. Um, however, there has also been a number of challenges and we have both reflected uh, critically on transdisciplinary research participation and our own project in our thesis and also in uh, conference papers. And we are at the moment uh, working with a conference paper and transforming it into an article where we discuss the issue of time in transdisciplinary research, time as an issue of power, where we discuss aspects such as who has time in transdisciplinary research <clears throat> and how is time related to aspects such as gender. There have also been inequalities between academic stakeholders uh, in this case, between us as researchers coming from Sweden and our Kenyan colleagues, where as a PhD student, when you come from Sweden, you can devote the majority of your time to um, studying and attending conferences, writing and attending courses, whilst our Kenyan colleagues um, have a heavy workload as also being teachers, which creates a lot of inequalities when you are supposed to be working together as a group. There has also been an unequal access to knowledge within the project, mainly between the researchers and the practitioners, which is problematic if you are to look at uh, transdisciplinary research as a joint production of knowledge. And so there has been uh, an unequal access to knowledge where we as researchers, we have access to the global and local knowledge arena, whereas the practitioners have a very limited access to, to knowledge. So what we have seen in the uh, project in terms of inequalities are things that uh, needs to be uh, worked with in uh, transdisciplinary research, and we are now focusing on um, exploring questions such as um, how can successful upscaling of community-based tourism initiative be designed and sustained, and what structures and types of supports are needed in order to reach equal and gender-sensitive and transformative tourism development. Yes, and thank you. And you can find our thesis, at least mine, uh, now uh, at Mr. Open Futures uh, website. And Helena, when she's ready. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we have no time for questions because it's very tight and limited program. But if we have, we could come back to that in the end. Now on the stage, I invite. Uh, now we see. It's yours, yeah, Franklin Otiende. And you are in ecotourism as well and integrated it with sustainability. Please enter the scene. Thank you, good morning. My study was, one of my objectives was to basically look at how we can integrate environmental sustainability into ecotourism, new product development. If you are aware of the models for developing new tourism offerings or the uh, products, usually what is integrated in it is economic sustainability. Uh, there is little effort to integrate environmental sustainability or even social sustainability. Yet the premise of ecotourism that it should contribute to environmental sustainability. So at Dunga, there is a group called DECTA. They refer to themselves as Dunga Ecotourism Youth Group. And with this in mind, I wondered how do they integrate or how do they achieve environmental sustainability? With that in mind, um, 
I went to them, I explained the issues that govern or that are related to environmental issues, and the fact that tourism is the fastest growing industry globally, and with that there is a lot of generation of waste, but how do we handle this proactively because that is a premise of ecotourism. So that in these natural settings, even if tourists visit, there can still be environmental integrity. Um, I did collect data through group discussions and observation, which I analyzed through critical analysis of what things I observed and we discussed. I took a few of the factors. In fact, all of the factors that are usually considered in tourism, new offering development, but added to that deal with the environment, which were not included in the models developed by Compula and Edvanson. And these are included in environmental conservation and biodiversity conservation. The rest are there in existing models. So what I intended to do is to evaluate or assess if indeed at Dunga do they consider those factors when they develop their tourism offerings. And if they do, then how do they achieve it? Findings are too many to include here, so I'll just give you a capsule to swallow. What I found is that indeed Dunga considers environmental conservation and biodiversity, and of these two, biodiversity conservation was the most important factor they do consider, followed by environmental conservation. In fact, to them, these were important than the conventional factors considered in tourism development, new offering development. So the question was, if, if these factors are important, then how do they consider it? My finding is that they have the idea in mind, but the way to integrate that in their offering development is a challenge. Therefore, from the findings I got, I proposed a model that we can use to integrate this in tourism offerings. So from service concept development, that is the idea of the product that you have. And in tourism, the product is experience, is not the things that you take away. People travel to experience things. So that's the idea. Then the service process, all the stages that you go through to develop that product, and then the marketing. Then you subject all these for environmental, sustainability, economic, and social. But in my case, I just focused on environmental. Then after that, then you can go to the commercialization process and post-introduction. That was the model I proposed. That unless you are able to go through that and are certain that you can handle what you will get, then you don't need to go forward with product development. So I used the waste management hierarchy, which the first place is to avoid waste generation if you can. For example, if for most ecotourism enterprises are far from normal power lines. So rather than running a generator, you may use solar. Of course, you'll get less waste in fumes as opposed to solar. So do everything you can to avoid waste generation. If you cannot do that, you go to the next stage, which is to reduce, reduce generation of waste. So you must determine <clears throat> how can I reduce waste? What efficiencies can I improve? And if I will generate waste, then how can they be safely treated and disposed? If you cannot answer those questions in the positive, as an ecotourism, there's no need for you to go ahead and produce that product because most ecotourism destinations are detached from municipal waste management systems. Then if any waste, determine if they can be reused and determine exactly specifically in what will I reuse them? Not just they can be reused. Then from there you can go to the next, which is recycling. If the waste that you'll be generating can be recycled, you must be specific in what will I recycle them. 
And if they cannot be recycled, then are they biodegradable? Then you move to the next, which is disposal. You must determine in your area of jurisdiction, your ecological site where people come and visit. Then why will I biodegrade this waste? Will I use them as compost? Or will I be burning them? Or will I be burying them? And if they cannot be biodegradable, then what next? You have to determine, if you pass all through this affirmatively, then according to the concept I propose, then you can proceed with the new service development, that product. And it may persuasion that if this can be integrated in ecotourism environment, then the elusive promise of ecotourism can be realized. And that's all I have for now. We have gone to the, from the guide tours in ecotourism to, to waste and sustainability. So now I would like to invite Lillian, please. And now we are turning to marketplaces and your work on social capacity and climate change. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of my entire, my entire PhD work. And I was looking at social capital for adaptation to climate change in the river, Mara River Basin in Kenya. Um, as basically defined as possible, um, social capital it talks about the value that we attach to networks and relationships and what resources we can then leverage from these networks. So this, the past two days we've been talking about just cities. Uh, all of you will live here with an idea of what just cities are and what then you can uh, be able to do about it. That is possible because you're part of a network. So um, I wanted to look at how social capital improves uh, knowledge on climate change uh, because one, that is a very difficult concept to define, especially for the lay person. Uh, and even for us sitting in this room, we define climate change um, at different points. So there's someone who's going to tell us about the carbon emissions. There's someone who's going to focus mainly on the impacts of climate change. So our definitions all differ depending on the, uh, the profession you are in. Uh, I also wanted to look at how uh, social capital contributed or could potentially contribute to uh, solving the problem of climate change as it was already being uh, experienced in the Mara River Basin. Um, this takes us a bit back to our motto, our country motto, our national motto, which is Harambe, and we take that for granted. The idea of pooling resources or coming together as a community to address something that we think is a problem. So why climate change? Um, my first response to, response to that would be, it's climate change. Uh, but then most of us don't think about it in that way. Uh, we think about climate change um, Ironically, there are people who still think about climate change as not in my lifetime. The, the effects will not be that bad in my lifetime. So, um, however, the effects are already being experienced. We cannot ignore them. That has also been mentioned in this conference over and over. We can see uh, intense and erratic rains. The seasons have changed in terms of how, uh, as an agricultural community, we admit that the seasons have changed in terms of when we plant and when we harvest and what kinds of uh, crop we can plant. There is more heat, more drought. So those are all things that we need to acknowledge and that, that's why we have to talk about climate change. We also have to uh, give credit that we have an existing policy. We have a national response strategy. But like in most cases, the implement implementation is very slow. And even at times when we talk about implementation of the climate change policy, it tends to be skewed towards um, agriculture. We are talking about short-term uh, seeds or things that can grow within those uh, few months that we have rain or few weeks. But we, 
tend to neglect the other sectors in, in society that are touched by, the, uh, by climate change. Um, yesterday when the governor's office was giving their speech, they talked about resources being scarce and therefore having to prioritize what it is that we are going to implement. And therefore, you'll find that in most forums, we will rarely talk about climate change. We will talk about diseases, we will talk about endemic poverty, we will talk about unemployment, but we are not going to talk about climate change. So when you look at the effects and the scarcity of resources, it then makes sense that we would want to explore a resource that doesn't require as much financial investment, and the more you use it, the more it grows. So hence, social capital. So my methods of data collection, um, I used a questionnaire that was administered to about 400 um, households in the Mara River Basin. Uh, I used key informant interviews to get expert information on climate change especially. Focus group discussions um, with a bit of a twist. Um, I was a practitioner before I was an academic um, and I appreciate the use of rapid appraisal uh, tools. Um, so my FGDs were not the normal conventional academic FGDs, but I injected a bit of PRA um, into it. And um, a question you would ask is why Mara River Basin? We are in Kisumu. This is one of the rivers that drain into the Lake Victoria. And yesterday I remember Margaret saying that our planners need to look ahead. We need to think about uh, what's going to happen. So if there's a problem in the Mara River Basin, if their adaptive capacity is low, then that's going to be eventually a problem for people who depend on Lake Victoria. So just a bit of the things that I found. Um, social capital enhanced uh, climate change knowledge. Um, one was the intimate networks, people you live with in the house. So that exchange of information was very important. And reason being that these are people you talk to probably on a daily basis. So within the household, your neighbors, that was important. The fact that you have a shared language makes it easy to decode some of those difficult things and discuss issues that might not uh, necessarily make sense to you. Trust, um, that was an important factor also. Then group membership, which is now uh, bonding social capital in my case, the diversity of members, group membership uh, made it possible for people to have diverse information on what climate change was. Then being part of a group uh, meant that you were obliged to undertake certain activities or attend certain workshops and therefore get to enhance your knowledge on climate change. And finally, there were certain external organizations that were working in this area that were very critical uh, in improving the knowledge of these people on climate change. In terms of implementation, um, I think the most critical or the most influential was the linking social capital, where the external organizations had a big influence on the activities that were being carried out in the area. And this was because mainly because they had resources. Uh, they were positioned in a uh, place where they were able to access resources from external donors and probably governments that the local community were not able to do so. And in certain cases, we also had organizations that were part and parcel of the government, or so arms of the uh, ministries and other arms of the government that had certain forms of authority that if they said that, okay, let us plant trees uh, because of one, two, three, then people listened. So that in increased the amount of activi uh, adaptation activities that were being carried out. Uh, bridging social capital, financial and psychological cost reduction. The fact that we are doing things as a group reduces the cost. So if we needed to contribute a certain amount of money, uh, say for rainwater harvesting, so buying tanks and putting the piping in place, if everybody's com contributing a bit of money at a time, then that of course reduces the financial cost. Psychologically, if we're doing it as a group, everybody is part of it, then uh, we feel that we are putting in uh, less effort. And finally, bonding social capital. Most of the people who undertook adaptation activities on their own say they did so for posterity, for future generations, which is an effect of social capital. So clearly from my study, this is something that uh, county governments need to look into because it requires very little investment and it gets people on board in terms of participation and helping them to understand the nitty gritties of climate change and how they can adapt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lilia.
program. Um, so we go from marketplaces and climate change now to prehistoric sentiment as a potential for ecotourism. Please take the stage, David. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. So this was uh, one of my objectives in my PhD study under ecotourism. And um, I was being supervised by Dr. Patrick Ayombe, Dr. Isai Njala, with an overall supervision by Professor uh, Stephen Agong. So, Heri cultural heritage in Kisumu range from archaeological sites, historical sites, paleontological sites, museums, mausoleums, to prehistoric settlements. This indicates that Kisumu has diverse cultural heritage and even natural heritage. We have the lake, we have the uh, beaches, we were told yesterday that we have almost 600 beaches and wetlands. But unfortunately, Kisumu is experiencing several challenges. The main one is um, low agricultural productivity in the recent periods. And um, as a, a fishing community, particularly the Luo, the fish resources have also declined over time. And the region is also seen to be a, bed, a, a hotbed of uh, opposition politics in Kenya and has been for some time been marginalized. You saw yesterday the railway terminus, the port is bogged down. Our manufacturing sector, the textile industry, the breweries, also, also actually stopped functioning. So the issue was a way to promote economic empowerment of the people in Kisumu City and its surroundings. So despite the numerical strength of our cultural heritage resources, we noted that uh, there was also a gradual and uh, serious decline of the heritage sites, particularly because of uh, human interference or cultural processes such as uh, farming, um, mining activities, and burning around the sites. So we deci I decided to choose or to look at the perception of the communities around these sites to understand whether they understood the values of these heritage destinations. The methods of this data collection that were used included uh, individual interviews, focus group discussions, photography, visual inspection of the sites, and uh, phenomenolog phenomenological of inquiry by identifying very elderly people around these sites who had lived for a very long time around these sites, who had interacted with them, to get more information about their values. I also did a survey using GIS mapping, and uh, those are the maps. You can see the location of Kisumu, the location of the sites, So, prehistoric settlements in this region are in three forms. One are dry stone walled enclosures, which are mainly found in southern Nyanza, south of Kisumu City. The other ones are earthworks, the Gundabuche, which are found in Kisumu and northern Nyanza. And then there's also a mixture of both 
the materials, the soil component and the rock material. So the values that were extracted during the study ranged from ecotourism, motoristic value, architectural value, aesthetic value, research value, ecological integrity value or environmental value, medicinal value, to economic value. So those are some of our prehistoric settlements, that is Tim Leach. And uh, you can see we have interior partitions, very dry, a kind of dry stone walling tradition, which is found not only here, but also in Great Zimbabwe, in South Africa, and also in Botswana, at Majojo and Domboshaba. That is Semeka Eila, one of the sites that uh, we also investigated. Then those are the earthworks, which are bank and ditch enclosures, similar to Bigo and, uh, in, uh, and Monsa in Uganda. That is um, the entrance, a very narrow entrance, meaning that these settlements were actually for defensive purposes against external human aggression or wildlife invasion. And uh, the research value, archaeological value, and the medicinal value is shown by some of these objects found, and the plants, like the cactus plant in the middle, is very important in uh, curing skin diseases. Without the support from Mistra, Clip, and uh, other institutions, both international and local, this research would have not been possible. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for this interesting aspect of uh, ecotourism. And now I invite Friedrich Humondi to take the scene. And uh, now we are back to Kisumu and the urban green. Good morning. My PhD research topic was on urban green space planning as a strategy for ecotourism trans transformation. But for the purpose of this conference, I chose on one objective, which is the effect of diminishing urban green spaces on environmental quality in Kisumu City. And my supervisors were Dr. Patrick Ayombe and Professor Steven Gaya Agong. And uh, we all realized that green spaces are quite important in, in, in enhancing the quality and aesthetic value of city life. But Kisumu City has been experiencing a number of problems. This has been one of these uh, is the socio, socio spatial, we have environmental as well as economic challenges. And so, in order to try and solve some of these problems, then this study came in handy. For example, if you walk around Kisumu City, you realize that there's a number of societal problems. For example, uh, for, for example, encroachment on green spaces, and also on road reserves. And this has been as a result of planning authorities failing to enforce planning interventions. For example, oil market was an informal market, but initially it had been zoned as a public park. But this has since been reclaimed by the current government of, of Kisumu, and it's being reclaimed and put into its correct use. I used remote sensing images. And these were quick bird image of 2005. We had World View 2 image of 2010 and GOI image of 2014. Very high resolution images. They have 50 centimeter resolution. And they are very good for change detection analysis. On methodology, we had 
two types of data. This, uh, that was prim uh, primary data as well as secondary data. And uh, for secondary data, we had the images, the three images for the three, for the two, for 2005, 2010, and 2014. And then secondary, we had topo sheets to a scale of one is to 50,000. And these were digitized, and in order to compare what was on the ground and whatever was on the images and the topo sheets, we also, we also did ground truthing. We, uh, we analyzed the data and came up with results. And here, we find that the green space has been diminishing over years. From 2005 to 2014, it reduced to about 19.5%. And that's a very big reduction. And uh, uh, we are anticipating that if at all interventions are not taken in, then by the year 2030, the green space would reduce up to zero. But there are various, <laughs> there are number of comments that uh, we came up with. One of these is that the County Council of Kisumu needs to come up with a, with a, with a policy that is to promote green city planning. And also, the citizens must also, be, must also be engaged in planning of these green spaces. Apart from the citizens, we also require the government and the civil society, as well as neighborhood associations within our various uh, neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you everybody and uh, it will be exciting now to develop the research further and we, but somehow we will come back to ecotourism and marketplaces somehow because it's hanging together though in the development of Kisumu city and the improvement of life for, for people here. And uh, from our perspective, from the PhD students and from supervisors, uh, one development could be also to cooperate between the platforms to share supervision of PhDs because it's a good way of learning from each other and giving back and I think we can do that in a very efficient way. So, and the students are door openers for, for the future. Thank you. <laughs>